Good morning. Welcome to Fairmount Christian Church at Home Edition. My name's Tracy Thomas. I'm the worship and music minister at Fairmount. Thank you for inviting us into your homes this morning. Today, I would like to invite you into my home. A few of my family members and I would like to ask you to join with us and worship today. Great to be with you this morning, and great to be outside, as lots of us are getting outside nowadays. Already, Mr. Bluebird has been at the bird feeder, followed by Mr. Sparrow, and then after that came Mr. Squirrel. It seems like they're busy this morning. Of course, the scripture does say, if you don't get out and work, then you're probably not going to eat, and that has a lot of application by what we're all going through today. And by the way, it's Mother's Day, so we want to say Happy Mother's Day, and we want to say especially to all of our moms who have sacrificed and loved us and in many ways put up with us. We love you, and we celebrate with you, and I want to send out a special Happy Mother's Day back to mom in Missouri, and so we think about our moms today. I'm reminded of the morning time. In fact, I love the word morning. Morning means that the night is gone and the day is here. As Henry Wadsworth Longfellow would say, "'Tis always morning somewhere, and it is good to serve God, especially in the morning, I mean early. Physically speaking, the sooner we start following Jesus, the better." That's why it's so important that we're doing everything in this season to make sure that our kids, our little ones, are following Jesus. Thanks, moms. Thanks, dads, for making sure that that is happening. As well as physically and spiritually, emotionally, mentally, 
it is good to serve God early. The longer that we wait, the harder that it gets. And who better than David, who would get up early in the morning and as a shepherd boy would recognize that God is not only with us, but he walks with us through the valley, through the darkness. There is morning on the other side. I'd like to read today our scripture from Psalm 119, and we'll start around verse 145. I will call with all of my heart, answer me, O Lord, and I will obey your decrees. I call out to you, save me, and I will keep your statutes. I rise before dawn, and I cry for help. I have put your, my hope in your word. My eyes stay open through the watches of the night, that I may meditate on your promises. Hear my voice in accordance with your love. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your laws. Those who devise wicked schemes are near, but they are far from your law. Yet you are near, O Lord, and all of your commandments are true. Long ago I learned from your statutes that you established them to last forever. Early before the dawn, David says, I remember what you have said. I focus on your plan for my life. No wonder that they would say this about David, that he was a man after God's own heart as he would seek God early in his life. As we get ready for this sermon series on the book of 1 Peter, it's important, especially today as we talk about holiness, that we serve God with everything that we have early, emotionally, physically, spiritually, mentally, to put God number one in our life. The reminder then is that God is not only with us, he is, as David says today, he is near you. And just as God takes care of Mr. Bluebird and Mr. Sparrow and Mr. Squirrel, we're reminded that God is taking care of you. These principles have not changed, and as David said, they last forever. On this day, as we think about our holiness and we celebrate our moms, Let's remember our Heavenly Father who has given us all of these many, many blessings, not just to enjoy them, but remember, as we said last week, to share them. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for this glorious day. Thank you for the morning. Thank you, Father, that your creation this morning has not only served you well by doing what you created them to do, but they have reminded us, Father, that we are to serve you well that early in our lives, physically, emotionally, spiritually, that, Father, we're putting you number one. We pray a special blessing for our moms today, wherever they are, and whether they are in your keeping or, Father, in ours, we pray that you will give us the joy that comes by knowing and sharing love together. Father, we pray for families today. We pray that you will strengthen moms and dads and kids and during this season that, uh, Father, we will discover your faithfulness. We thank you for the Apostle Peter, Father, who loved you even though he denied you, Father, to know that as David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because you are with me. Thank you, God, for being near us today. Help us, Father, with all of our strength to serve you early. Thank you, Father, for Jesus, our Savior. Thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit that guides us and provides for us. And we pray in all things, Father, that you will be glorified in our lives. And we pray that in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Have a great day, and Lord willing, we'll see you next Lord's Day. We come now to the time in our service where we're going to partake of communion together. I trust that you've been able to gather in your homes whatever you're using for your communion emblems. Today's theme is holiness, and as we prepare for our time of communion, I'd like to invite you to sing with me and Allie, Take Time to Be Holy. Thank you. 
For some reason the other day I was thinking, you know, what was the beginning, the original reason that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper as we know it today? So in reading in Matthew, I found that Jesus' direction to the disciple was to go and prepare a supper to keep the Passover. In other words, to be faithful to the Passover. This was not a typical day, nor was it a typical week. The day was the first day of unleavened bread. And I feel certain that Jesus had something else in mind besides just having supper with his disciples. If we go to Matthew 26, according to the scripture, now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where will you prepare supper for us to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my hour has come. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus directed them as they prepared the Passover. Now if we go to Exodus to look at the Passover, the significance of the Passover, uh, it's interesting that the Jews have been captive in, in Egypt for, for years. And God uh, spoke to Moses while Moses had, had fled into the desert. He said, go to pay a Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. They've been through nine plagues. The rivers turned to blood, the darkness, the locusts. And now comes the tenth plague. This is the final plague. And God said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning months. shall be the first month of the year. Tell all the congregation of Israel on the tenth day of the month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. Your lamb shall be without blemish, male a year old. And you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood, put it on the doorposts and the lintel of the house in which they eat it. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall or destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. Now, one side note in all of this too, when we talk about an unblemished lamb, the Hebrew word for lamb is the word tale. Tale also is the root word in Hebrew for covering. <clears throat> That's significant because under the old covenant, if a sin was committed, there was a blood covering until the next sin we committed. And then there had to be another blood covering. That was under the old covenant. Under the new covenant, Jesus' work on the cross has changed everything. He has made it so that your sins and my sins are forgiven forever as far as the east is from the west. So while in the Passover, the tale was an unblemished lamb at the new covenant and Jesus' work on the cross, he is the Elohim tale, the lamb of God, Jesus Christ, sacrificed himself to save both Jew and Gentile and save the entire world from their sins. So the Passover and the Lord's Supper are indeed intrinsically linked through the blood of an unblemished lamb. Jesus is the focus of Scripture from Genesis to Revelations. And of course, the rest of the story is that on the first day of the week, Jesus was resurrected from the dead and lives today at the right hand of God the Father. And once we accept and believe this, we too are promised eternal life to live with him. So based on God's promise, we at Fairmount too are faithful to keep the Lord's Supper in recognition of his body that was slain and his blood that was shed for each one of us as payment for our sins 
the unblemished Lamb of God. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. His name is Jesus. Let us pray. Father God, your work on the cross has changed everything. While the tale unblemished was the covering of sins, Father, your death, your shedding of blood, the Elohim tale meant forgiveness of sins, forgiveness of sins forever, to be remembered no more as far as the East is from the West. And Father, we are eternally grateful for your work on the cross and the significance that it has in both the Old and the New Covenants to tie them together. Now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body that is broken for you. And he took the cup, and we had given thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink all of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which was shed for you, and which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us pray. Father God, we praise you that we're able to gather this morning, even though we're not here together to greet one another properly, Lord. The church is still alive. And Father, you are alive today because of your work on the cross. And Father, you have brought us eternally a life which, for which we are eternally grateful. And Father, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for this day. And Lord, we lift up the service all in the name of Jesus. What's in his precious name we ask it. Amen. Good morning. As we come to the time of our service uh, for our offering, I want to remind you of just the multiple ways that you can give during this time. And you'll see those ways uh, on your screen right now. And uh, as you look at those, I just want to commend you again for your faithfulness in giving. And I want you to know that your giving is not just enabling our ministries at Fairmount to continue to thrive in this time of isolation, but you're also enabling ministries uh, of our partners to continue to thrive. And so what we want to do over the next few weeks is we want to share with you each week how your giving is enabling ministries to continue to thrive in this time of exile and, and isolation uh, that we're experiencing through this pandemic. And so this morning, I want you to see a video from our friends at Good News Productions out of Joplin, Missouri. And Mike Schrage is going to share with you uh, how they are continuing to thrive and expand their ministries and work uh, toward accomplishing uh, God's goals uh, for his kingdom today. So go ahead and watch this video. We here in Joplin, Missouri are healthy and doing well. And trust, that's the same for you during these unprecedented times. But you know, we couldn't do what we are doing around the world without your partnership and your care and your prayers and financial engagement. And for that, we are very, very humbled and very appreciative. And what has that done? Well, you know, I just finished earlier today a call with over Zoom, all of our regional directors, and I wish you could have been on the call with us to have heard, like the Easter program in India that reached millions of people. While they were locked in their homes, the gospel was not locked out from them and access for sure. Or going over to the Philippines and hearing about how they're utilizing social media there in the Philippines with programs that they're doing, or even in Mexico and how they're using Facebook over and over, whether it's nutritional elements, whether it's worship, whether it's Bible studies, they are using the latest technology tools to reach people for Jesus Christ. You are making a difference. And I could talk to you about all the other regional centers or even our nomad teams for that matter, but your partnership, is making a difference. Your faith is getting broadcast to people literally around the world. And so while they're getting locked in their homes, 
they are not locked out of the gospel's access. And so we appreciate you. So from all of us here in Joplin at GMPI, thank you. God bless you. God keep you safe and healthy. And we continue to appreciate our partnership together. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Heather Card, and I would like to wish all of our mothers tuning in today Happy Mother's Day. Over the past week, we've been doing a contest online to celebrate our mothers, and today I am very excited to announce the prizes and winners. Drum roll, please. Congratulations to our 10 runner ups. Each of you will be receiving a $15 Target gift card in the mail as a small appreciation from our church for all that you do. We hope you enjoy it. And finally, the moment you have all been waiting for. Congratulations to our grand prize winner, Janie Barnes. You will be receiving this special Mother's Day basket with all sorts of goodies in it. Thank you to everyone who participated and thank you to all of our mothers for all that you do every day. Happy Mother's Day. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to our home today as uh, we are along with you worshiping in our homes and it's a privilege for Betsy and I to welcome you into our home today as we continue this beautiful worship service. Happy Mother's Day to all you moms. I'd like to give a shout out to my godly mom and I'd like to give a shout out to the, the godly mom of my children. If you'd like to give a shout out to your mom, go down to the chat section or into the remarks or the uh, the comment section below the video and share and, and, and Shout out her name today and let her know that you love her and are praying for her. You know, this is a day, Mother's Day is a day where we bow our heads and, and give thanks for uh, those moms who gave us life. I think it's also an interesting day where we can also give thanks for those people who are moms to us. And I think you all know uh, who I mean, who that is in your life. Well, that's one of the great privileges of being the, the preacher of a church. Is I, it, For me, I have 600 moms, and that's a great thing. And so today, uh, we just want to say Happy Mother's Day to all of those uh, moms out there. I raise today my uh, coffee cup uh, to those moms and encourage you to do the same. My mom was never a coffee drinker. She was a tab drinker. For the young people out there, call your grandparents and ask them what tab is. Um, now, I was I wasn't going to do tab today, but I will uh, raise my coffee cup, uh, coffee cup in honor of my uh, mom and, of course, of Betsy today. Uh, so today, uh, today here at uh, Fairmount, uh, we are embarking on a new sermon series. We're calling this sermon series "Exiled: Thriving in Isolation." Now, speaking of Mother's Day, there are probably some moms out there who are wishing for a little bit of isolation right now. They're probably going crazy uh, here in the midst of all of this uh, home time. And so maybe dads, maybe uh, kids, uh, today one of the greatest gifts you could give that mom in your life is a little bit of isolation time, a little bit of alone time, uh, just for her to enjoy some quiet uh, for her Mother's Day today. I don't know, just a thought, something to think about. You know, uh, but exiled, thriving in isolation. You know, it looks like that the isolation that has been forced on us is going to be coming to an end relatively soon for some of us. But I also think that this isolation that has been forced upon us is going to be lasting for a very long time for many of us that are, that are taking part in this worship service today. This is such a remarkable time that we're living in. You know, I was born right after uh, the uh, <clears throat> the assassination of President Kennedy, born into the, the chaos of that, that time in our nation's life. Um, I, uh, I've lived through the, the political upheaval that was Watergate. Um, I've seen our nation go to war in Vietnam, in Iraq, in Kuwait, in Afghanistan. Uh, I remember 9-11 like it was yesterday. Um, you know, I've lived through economic upturns and downturns and, and incredible sways in, in our nation's economy. But nothing, nothing has uh, impacted my life like this, this period we're going through now, this prolonged daily life alteration that COVID-19, this COVID-19 pandemic has brought to our community, our nation, and of course the whole world. 
Words such as quarantine, uh, isolation, social distancing. These are words that we now use every day. Who would have ever dreamed? They've become the norm. You know, today, for, I'm, I'm coming to you from my living room. You're sitting in your living room or in your kitchen or wherever, uh, taking part in today's worship service. I, I was listening to Sirius XM the other day, and, and one, of the, um, one of the DJs was, was uh, coming on the air, and he said to his listeners, he said, good morning. Morning, inmates. It is it is as if we are exiles in our own country. In his letters, the Apostle Peter addresses people exiled in their own world. Now, those those aren't my words. Those aren't preacher words. Just to make it fit the theme today, those are his words. Listen to what he says as he opens up his first letter. Peter writes in First Peter one one. He says, Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, they were not exiles in the, in the actual sense. The government of the day had not sentenced them uh, to leave the nation. They had not uh, expelled them from the country in some formal sense. There, there have been lots of exiles, lots of famous exiles over the years. Um, Napoleon was uh, exiled not once, but twice. Um, Victor Hugo, in, in exile, writes the, the incredible, beautiful, moving story of Les Miserables. Um, the Apostle John is exiled to the island of Patmos, where he writes the Revelation. So, you know, there are formal exile, uh, people who are in exile. Peter's not addressing those kinds of folks. He's not addressing actual political or judicial exiles. But he uses that term very specifically and very wisely. He calls his fellow Christians exiles because they were living in a land that was not their own. If you are a follower of Jesus, then your nationality is not your home. This is not your home. You're in this country temporarily until you can go home to your home country, till you can go home to where your heavenly father is, to where your eternal family is. Peter refers to us as exiles. Now, during our recent social isolation, we have become in many ways exiles. We've been cut off from what is normal. We've been cut off from so much of what makes life what we are accustomed to. We, we walk through our neighborhoods. Lots of folks are walking these days. That's a good thing. But we're keeping our distance from people as we are going throughout our own neighborhoods. We go to the grocery store and we wear our masks and we stay separately, you know, apart from each other. Uh, we get in, we get out, you know, no, no chit-chatting in the frozen food aisle. You know, we, this is a new normal for us. Workplace camaraderie is now replaced with video conferencing etiquette on Zoom. These are just strange times that we're living in. That's why Chris and Seth and I decided to go through the book of First Peter this month. It's a book that addresses what it means to live outside of the normal, what it means to live in crisis mode, what it's like to live under the mandates of a government that's, that's dictating our daily uh, ways of living. To be living in isolation away from the, the personal, the, 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 the touch that we so much crave. Throughout the letter, 1 Peter, he gives strategies for thriving in isolation. Now, I expect most of us are doing okay, you know, and, and it's okay to be doing okay during this strange time. But at some point, as followers of Jesus, we want to aspire to something more than just being okay. We want to thrive, Proverbs 29.2 says, when the righteous thrive, the people rejoice. I want to do more than just survive this pandemic. I want to thrive, even in the midst of circumstances that I have never, ever encountered before, and I hope never encounter ever again. 
So taking one chapter each week, we are gleaning from the word, we're gleaning from Peter's letter, five strategies for making the most of this current crisis. It's, it's really for making the most of any crisis, whether that crisis is today or tomorrow or next month or next year or 10 years from now, whatever crisis we may face, Peter gives us strategies to thrive during those times. This particular crisis is a crisis of isolation. So we're pulling out five strategies. I'm confident we could pull out even more, but here is our first strategy that is shared with us by Peter today. And the first strategy we find is simple words, be holy, be holy. Now, I think that's probably one of those words from the Bible that we really feel uncomfortable um, uh, ascribing to ourselves. You know what I mean? I I look at it like this. We we always say, you know, we, we always question someone who says something like, yes, my greatest, my greatest quality is my humility. We would always question, of course, their humility, wouldn't we? We, we? we don't like to refer to ourselves as humble, do we? We don't like to think of ourselves as saints, even though the Bible says that we are. It's just we don't feel comfortable calling ourselves saints. I think we also don't like to think of ourselves as holy. I'm not holy. That's that super Christian that sits on the other side of the, of the church when I come in. That's, that's the person who has the whole Bible memorized. That, that's the person who never sins. And you've probably somebody going through your mind right now. And that person is holy. Sure, not me. But you know what? I have to say sorry. The Bible says that if you're a follower of Christ, you are holy. The Bible calls us to be holy. And whether we like the word or whether we're comfortable with the word or not, holiness is a part of the Christian's DNA. This is a central theme of 1 Peter chapter 1. This is a strategy for thriving in isolation. Now, we want you to read a chapter of 1 Peter every week. Well, you know, it won't take you too long. You can read 1 Peter 1 today, and then some point during this week, uh, read 1 Peter chapter 2, and, and you yourself will start to glean from it strategies for thriving in isolation. Uh, so you do that on your own. We're just going to pick f- out five of those things, but I wanted you to listen to this, this part of 1 Peter chapter 1. Listen to what Peter says in verses 13 through 16. He says, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. The biblical concept of being holy, of holiness, is not really that difficult, that that complicated of a concept. It just happens to be a word that, I'll say it, it's a word that frightens us. Holiness requires a personal stance of being set apart. Being set apart. Upon our decision to follow Jesus, God sets us apart from the rest of the world. We are different. We are special. Now, in chapter two, which you'll read later on this week, in chapter two, verse nine, Peter explains that even further. He says, you, he's talking about the church, he's talking about God's people, he's talking about followers of Jesus. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. God's Holy Spirit lives in us, making us holy. The issue becomes, is holiness evident in our lives? He said, be holy in all you do. Is holiness evident in our our lives? Our actions should set us apart from the world around us. Christians should be seen as different because we are. Jesus calls us in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus calls us to be salt and light. We are to enhance the world around us. We are to bring light to dark places. We cannot do those things if we are the same as everyone else. We are holy. 
We are set apart by God. Therefore, our lives and our actions will be different from the rest of the world's, or at least they should be. Can we be different in this particular time that we're going through right now? You know, we're all holed up in our homes. Well, many of us are working from home. We're eating at home. We're entertaining ourselves at home. How can we demonstrate our holiness isolated at home? Well, I'm glad you asked. I dare say the opportunities actually abound. Just because we are physically in isolation does not mean that our impact is locked up at home as well. Peter mentions in this central passage today, five characteristics of a holy lifestyle. And a quick glance at those things tells us how holiness can be exhibited even in isolation. Now, there is much more to holiness, but that holy lifestyle, according to Peter, in, in the passage we just read a, a bit ago, the uh, holy lifestyle includes alertness. He says, My, having minds that are alert. Just because we're in isolation doesn't mean that our spiritual lives can relax. Do you think Satan is self-quarantining right now? Do you think he's taking a break during this period? We have to stay alert. We have to pray. We have to read our Bibles. We have to spend time in worship. We have to manage what we're reading. We have to manage what we're watching. We have to manage what we're doing online. We need to alertly keep our eyes fixed on Jesus at all times. That holy lifestyle also includes sobriety. He says, minds that are fully sober. Now, of course, drunkenness is not an option for a Christian, but the sobriety that Peter uses here to describe a holy life is the soberness of mind, the soberness of thought. We are not panicking. We are not fearful. We are not anxious. Our feet are fully grounded as we consider the crisis of the day. And really, as we consider any crisis, our feet are grounded solidly on the solid rock of Christ. People can count on us. We are not wavering in the winds of adversity. We are sober-minded. <clears throat> that holy lifestyle also includes hopefulness. That is, I think, my favorite word in the English language, the word hope. Peter says, set your hope. We are people of hope. We know that nothing we face on this earth is greater than Jesus. Jesus said, in this world, you will have many troubles, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This creates in us an infectious hopefulness. It shows up in our conversations with people. It shows up uh, on our social media posts. It shows up in our demeanor toward family and friends. Holy people are hopeful people. That holy lifestyle also includes obedience. <clears throat> Peter refers to us as obedient children. Now, the attribute that Peter indicates here is obedience to the commands of God. This most definitely sets us apart from the rest of the world. God's ways are not our world's ways. Our language is different. Our morality is different. Our choices are different. Our priorities are different. Our spending is different. Our isolation is different. And that fifth thing that he mentions in this passage is that a holy lifestyle includes non-conformity. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Obviously, obedience and nonconformity are tied to each other, but they, but they bear separating as well. The world would most definitely have us value what they do. They would have us do what they do. They would have us worry like they worry. They would have us be like them. Peter says, no, a holy life does not conform to the evil desires we used to live in. A holy life is transformed by a relationship with Christ. You know, uh, ESPN has had an isolation gold mine with the airing of the 10-part series, The Last Dance. This is a documentary on the life and career of, of NBA uh, superstar uh, Michael Jordan. Uh, most think the greatest NBAer of all time. 
In 1992, Gatorade got a whole lot of traction with their ad campaign featuring Michael Jordan, as a lot of companies did. The campaign for Gatorade was simply called Be Like Mike. Mike. Michael Jordan, uh, he drank Gatorade, and then he would go out and he would dunk a basketball. He would jump as high as the roof. He would win championships. And if you wanted to do those things, then be like Mike. <laughs> I could drink 12 gallons of Gatorade a day and I would not be like Mike. He was incredible. Peter, Peter gives us a higher standard. He gives us a lofty standard, a much loftier than any, any athlete or celebrity. Be holy, he says, because God is holy. Be like God. And though we will never obtain divinity, we can follow the example set by God when God came in human flesh, when he came as Jesus, who as a man walked this earth, did what we did, experienced what we experienced, experienced temptations and crises just like we do. We can indeed be like Jesus. And that is a holy standard that we should aspire to. If you want to thrive during this time of isolation, if you want to come out on the other side of this pandemic even stronger than today, then embrace holiness. Embrace being different from the world. Measure your life on the clear, unwavering, but grace-filled scales of Scripture. Even in isolation, the world is watching Neighbors are watching neighbors. Coworkers are watching coworkers. Everything is online. Zoom, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all of these things. The world is watching. May they see us holy in all that we do. Would you pray with me? Father, that word holy can be so intimidating to us. We look at, at, at the tenets of Scripture and we see such high standards there and we think that we could never meet them and we can't. We can't meet them without your help. We're set apart by you. We're holy because you've made us holy. So today, Father, I ask you to give us the courage and the wisdom on how to be holy. Father, our world is watching us in so many different ways, and may they see us living to the truths of, of Scripture. May they see us living like Jesus lived. May they see us being holy as you intended our holiness to look like. May we be different from the world in which we live. Lord, help us to minister to this world. Help us to serve this world. Help us to love this world and to show them the ways of Christ so they too can achieve holiness and eternal life. Help us today, Father, to be your light, to be your salt in this world today. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to thank you for uh, joining us for uh, worship today. As we say each and every time uh, that uh, we have the opportunity, if you have any needs whatsoever, I please, I ask that you reach out to us and let us know what they are so that we can do everything we can to help you. If you have a decision that you need to make, a spiritual decision and the next step in your walk for Christ, uh, then I pray also that you reach out to us and let us know uh, what, uh, what decision you need to make or what decision you need to talk about. If you need prayer, again, reach out to us. We would, be, we would love to pray with you. After this service is over, there'll be uh, on the screen the different ways in which you can reach out to us, and I hope that you will do so. Uh, for today, uh, it has been a privilege to worship with you, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you for joining with us online this morning, and as we come to the end of our service, I invite you to sing this song with us. wonderful day.